Perfect. Okay, great. So welcome everyone to um, Podchat Live episode 70, where we're going to be talking um, pharmacology. So the, the, the wonderful uh, study of drugs and their action on the body and the one and only Dr. Sharon Reese, who I'm sure most of you know, if you haven't been taught by her at some point, either like I was at university um, back in the early 2000s or at branch meetings or at our you know, college. She started life as a podiatrist herself, now uh, associate professor, therapeutics and prescribing at London South Bank. Um, massively grateful to have you here, Sharon. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, <laughs> anyone watching who has any, any questions for Sharon as we're going along, don't have to be really intense and, and deep about pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, although they can, she loves that stuff, but it's just, just daily pragmatic stuff that, that, that patients ask you and you want a little, you know, a nice little way of answering regular questions. Just fire. I've had a few emailed into me, which I'll be asking Sharon later myself. Um, but if you've got any of those fire away as we go and Craig and I will, will, will try and sort of, uh, field them as we can. Um, but we'll start off if we can Sharon by, uh, just asking you, uh, about your own journey because I know you started life um, as a podiatrist um, back in uh, 1990 I think something something in that low no. yeah um, and, and and obviously gone from far from, from podiatrist through to well, when I, when we first met at, at Northampton in 2002 you, you were my pharmacology lecturer and now moving up to associate professor um, you know therapeutics prescribing could you just talk us through that kind of interesting journey and whether you you obviously still have a fondness for us as podiatrists i hope but uh, whether you still sort of um identify as a podiatrist on any on any level uh yeah sure no thank you it's really remarkable that everybody's interested in in, in my journey but um for me the uh journey essentially started at queen's university in belfast where i went to do my phd and uh, they wanted somebody to help um uh in the medical school with the pharmacology teaching and i just you know junior lecturer put my hand up and said yeah that sounds fun you know i'll do that and i just really got into the subject so when i finished my phd i decided to study further myself and i went to oxford and did a master's degree in therapeutics and thereafter it's been the subject that i've pursued and specialized more and more as you say until uh, getting the role where i am now which is a fantastic role and i teach all sorts of prescribers some non-medical some independent as you say some who are just interested in one aspect of prescribing or selling supply in the case of some podiatrists um and i get to meet lots of interesting people and learn about a lot about drugs in all shapes and sizes Amazing. Um, and you, you touched on it a couple of times there. So we might as well just, just front foot this and get, get it out of the way. This is the terminology associated with, with drugs. So we talk about sort of administering drugs or, or supplying drugs or prescribing drugs. Um, and those things mean very different things, uh, you know, when it comes to the legality of it. Could you just clear up for us whether we, you know, depending on where we are, and obviously there are different tiers of, of, of study and different courses to do, but what are the levels of study, as you understand, with regard to podiatrists, as you come out of university and when you are a supplier, when you are a prescriber, etc.? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right that I think since the devolution of prescribing, I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but certainly in the UK, it has become quite confusing and it's moved at a fairly rapid pace. And it's not surprising that people get quite confused by it. Uh, when, after a certain period of time, I'm not sure when the extended list of sale and supply happened, but would have been sometime in the 90s, I think, that anybody that qualified after a certain year, I'm not sure exactly what that year is, they had what was called extended access and supply to a, a list, a formulary of restricted drugs. And those were the uh, amoxicillin, the erythromycin, the fluclox were the antibiotics on that, and codeine, dihydrocodeine, and uh, cocodamol. Um, for the opioids and obviously some of these are really serious drug groups that are the subject of uh, global uh, issues so even a sale and supply still very very important that we everybody gets it right in terms of safe prescribing of those so after a certain time people would have had that other people would have gone on to access this extended list via further studies that could have been a master's in surgery 
that might be have gone down the surgical route um, and been granted that when you're annotated as a surgeon, for example, that would be another route to getting it. Other people who qualified before that time might have done some further study. And there are more recently, there are about five different courses that people can, can go on um, at certain universities around the country to gain that saline supply if they want access to those drugs. So though that was the basics, people that qualified before that time might just have local anaesthetics, but that also includes Depomedrone, so they do have access to the steroid as well. If you've got access to local anaesthetic, you've got access to steroid, which some people don't know. I don't know if that's common knowledge or not, but sometimes people ask me about that. And then other people would have gone on to do a six month postgraduate course and become an independent prescriber, in which case they've got access to the whole formulary. Amazing. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Some of the questions that came in were was sort of around people, even podiatrists, qualified podiatrists, not being entirely sure exactly what they had access to, what they were allowed to, to keep, what they were allowed to supply. Um, people inappropriately saying we can prescribe amoxicillin, flucloxacin, and the word prescribe really not really not applicable or appropriate there. You are you are supplying it, not not prescribing it unless you go oh. on and do that. And the process would be would be that if you have access to that list, you whether it's from the hospital pharmacy, if you're NHS, or whether privately, you will go to a supplier. It might be your local pharmacist if you're in private practice. You will say, right, I want three full courses of flucloxacillin to be given 500 mg four times a day for seven days. You take away those packages of flucloxacillin after paying for them. <laughs> you put them in your cupboard. You lock it up and then when the patient comes along that you wish to supply it to, you might sell it and supply it if you're in private practice or of course if it's part of your hospital processes there will be a different process again, it would have already been paid for through the system and so you take it out of the cupboard and you give it to the appropriate patient. So there's no prescription pad, there's no PIN number involved, it doesn't get counted on PAC data, national statistics, anything like that. So it is a, a, a very small number of prescriptions that, well, not, sorry, small number, there's me doing it, small number of um, drug use going through that route. Yeah, yeah, and that's supply. And again, I don't know if it helps with the timeline, but I graduated 2003. And we certainly had the LA and the POM certificate. So it, just to help date that, I don't know how far uh, b before that it was happening, um, but it's certainly been happening since then. So anyone that graduated, we can say with fair, fair certainty from 03 onwards, has that POM certificate. So they have that ability. Uh, another question that regularly gets asked is what exactly what drugs do we as, as a, you know, just a graduate podiatrist since 2003, what drugs do we have that access to that we can sell slash supply? Yep, so the three antibiotics, and the doses aren't specified on this, are amoxicillin, uh, flucloxacillin, both very useful drugs, of course, um, but the less useful drug there is erythromycin because it was put on the original list, I'm assuming, because it was a suitable alternative. But really, that's from 20 years ago. Almost nobody will prescribe erythromycin anymore to adults. It has a role where somebody is breastfeeding, but really it's been superseded by clarithromycin and it's a really horrible drug to use so i would just advise some caution before putting somebody on erythromycin but it is on the list the other oral drugs that are on the list are cocodamol no specified dose codigamol 10 in 500 so that's 10 milligrams of um uh, dihydrocodine and 500 paracetamol and just pure codeine phosphate all the other agents on there are topicals like sulfur sulfadiazin which is mainly for burns um, tioconazole very much superseded now by other more modern antifungals um, and a moral philamacil cream um, sorry, not lamsal cream, amorophin, amorophin cream, loxoril, that's, the, that's what I meant to say, um, which has been discontinued, so obviously not useful from that perspective, and a topical loxoril as well, and yep. topical hydrocortisone, that's the other thing on the list. So six oral agents. Perfect, and interesting, no um, tabinophene, no lamasil on there, so we are not allowed to, to keep se uh, sell slash supply lamasil, but we can say go to the pharmacy and get some yeah which is a slight, there's a subtle difference there in sales supply versus 
recommending going to the pharmacy? Yes, whenever you do recommend anything, even something simple, that you should still be professional and do the safety netting that's appropriate, advise people how long they're going to need to take it for, what strength you might recommend if there is a difference and so on. So there should still be some information around that if you're going to take the responsibility of recommending it to somebody. Perfect. So where should we go here? Is it, is it your take that at least with these drugs that we have this, this sort of access to sales supply that, that we should very much um, have a good understanding of their route from when they go in this end to when they come out the other end? So how they're absorbed, how they're distributed, how they act within the body, there is, you know, you know, what, how, you know what, what they act on, how they're excreted. Is it that level of knowledge that I know we should all have if we got that certificate from university, but perhaps if it's been a few years, um, we're, we're rusty. Is it something that we, we, we really should be, be up to speed with? In the perfect world, I guess one might say yes to that, but I think it's much, much more important to maintain a contemporary knowledge of how the drugs are used in current practice. And that is so much more important. Always the principles of understanding how to use a drug safely if you are the one giving it to somebody by whatever route is always going to be important. But most of that is covered by the dose that is appropriate because that will be the dose that will be absorbed to the acceptable amount in a regular person. Um, the instructions as to how to take it and how to optimise absorption are also there via the patient information, the leaflet and the dispensing information. And as long as you're following the principles of safety, so you've got no known reason for renal or hepatic impairment for any of these drugs, then that side of it really is already taken care of. And I would say it's much more important to focus on what current management is and it does change so for example there's been an alteration for higher doses of flu clocks for shorter periods of time for example so a five-day course uh, are recommended quite often for cellulitis at 500 mg to one gram qds depending on the person's uh, immune status etc so it's more important to know what is appropriate practice and when in the case of antibiotics good antibiotic stewardship understanding the principles that anybody involved with antibiotic use has to be aware of um quick question that's come in uh from robin um on, on the note of antibiotics uh he's studying uh, he says uh, why would you use amoxicillin instead of flucloxacillin or vice versa what would lead you to decision making between those two commonly used uh, antibiotics yeah um that's a great, great question thank you robin they do have different roles now amoxicillin was uh, was one of the drugs that came about first one of the earlier drugs and this is one of the few broad spectrum penicillins that we have and when we need to cover a number of organisms, for example, for a community acquired pneumonia, you can't absolutely know which organism is going to be causing that. Could be strep pneumonia, could be Haemophilus influenza, etc. You need to take a broad spectrum approach because you are essentially using an empirical approach. You just, you're not sure, you're going to use something broad spectrum, you're going to cover all eventualities and hopefully that's going to work. The times when you can use flu clock safely are only the times when you've narrowed down the agent, the infective agent, to either Staph aureus or Strep pyogenes. It covers you only for those two gram-positive organisms. And so it's pretty much as narrow as spectrum as any antibiotic can get. And even further to that, beta-lactamase producing, meaning that Fluclox was derived from some of the original penicillins with a reinforced part that works and that stops those some of those enzymes from breaking it down so it carries on working so it's very very specific so a cellulitis nearly always staph or strep perfectly reasonable to use flu blocks not reasonable to use amoxicillin first line because it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut and that's bad antibiotic guardianship so there'll be subtleties as to which you would use and when but broadly that is the principle great Brilliant answer. And a couple of quick questions.
questions while I've got them, just so that I don't lose them in the feed. George asked, are you aware when the next list update might be? Is there one due? Or is it something that's done on a certain timeline? I'm not privy to that information. I know there is a medicines committee at each professional organisation, and certainly it's something that I've heard raised a few times at conferences, and I have already alluded to the fact that erythromycin is outdated, and it would be a very unpleasant thing to do to a patient to give them erythromycin when there is a kinder and safer alternative that doesn't cost any more. And so really that does need to be replaced by clarithromycin on that list. And certain things should be updated and clarified and perhaps added to. You mentioned about tabinafin, for example, that seems perfectly reasonable. But I don't know who on this committee goes is putting drugs through this process because for everything that gets added it has to go to public consultation and has to go through often places like the home office to be rubber stamped so it really is a very very rigorous process to add drugs to a list and maybe there's a, a risk that when opioids and some antibiotics are seen on there there's not even be a risk that some drugs might be taken away from the advisory committee for the misuse of drugs for example so I'm not sure how they do this, but it doesn't seem to be on any kind of rolling program. That list has been in place for, for really, maybe could be said too long. <laughs> yeah, do, do an update. And last yeah. question before we move on from Crispy. Uh, do you think there'll come a time when independent prescribing is part of uh, the undergraduate degree, undergraduate program? Or do you think it'll always be a separate postgrad? This is something that bounces back and forth for all professions, in fact. And I think... If there were appropriate changes to bolster all the different courses, I think that maybe at some point that will happen. I know that the term that's being banded around now is prescribing ready and nurses going through their new apprenticeship processes and the new courses aim to have nurses just that prescribing ready. So they are able to, for example, prescribe paracetamol, ibuprofen, certain things that they're going to use routinely, a lot of the dressings, things routinely in the practice that they will need. And that's a common sense approach. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think there is an issue when you think about the five year medical degree, we used to let medics come out and prescribe straight away, but now we don't and haven't done for quite some time. They have to do the prescribing um, assessment, which is a two part exam through their foundation years before they are able to access prescriptions in all the areas that they will eventually be able to prescribe in. And that shows you the complexity of an, an accountability related to the process. So I think if things change, maybe the course gets longer, the teaching changes, the assessment changes, then there could be some level of that. But full independent prescribing, it's a big ask. Yeah, particularly if doctors aren't, aren't leaving university with that with that um too many errors too many mistakes yeah. too many deaths yeah which is which is a big deal um great i don't think there's any other questions on there just a little a lovely comment from uh, adrianne who's a third year northampton student who says she's loving this for exam revision so that's nice <laughs> hopefully her exams are still going ahead i i, I, I i'm assuming universities are still having their exams. yeah they're just putting them online um, instead just putting them online no escape uh, sadly adrianne but yeah um so we talked. I think we've talked about enough about about the list of POMs, the sales supply. We talked a little bit at the start about the other drugs that, as graduating podiatrists or graduate podiatrists, we have access to, which is the local anaesthetics and, as you said, depot medrone as well. So, could we just speak to those a bit? I'm guessing that with all of the branch meetings you do and the CPD you do, the, the biggest question that you get asked about LA is probably things like which ones we have available to us what are the maximum safe doses if we could just uh, go over that kind of basic because we do we certainly have you know, people students watching which i think would definitely find that useful yeah 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 certainly um so the uh, the traditional low anesthetics of course were um, your lidocaine or pivocaine um bupivacaine and plain solutions originally only without adrenaline allowed but with the more recent lists that are associated with people that have qualified over the last few decades as again i don't know the exact date then some non-plain solutions for bupivacaine so adrenaline is allowed with bupivacaine and with lidocaine on that list and also the two i say newer they're from 2000 onwards which that's 20 years ago uh, rupivacaine um, and levu bupivacaine are also on that list now as well and anybody that's got a local anesthetic certificate 
also has now um, adrenaline on that list so that were the worst case scenario to happen and an anaphylactic reaction occurred, you can rescue your patient. So everybody should have that drawn up and ready to go on their tables when they do any surgeries. Um, but also Depomedrone on its own, not with lidocaine, just Depomedrone on its own comes as part of that package, which means that you don't have to go through patient group directions or be a prescriber or anything in order to access and administer Depomedrone as part of musculoskeletal clinics. Now, just being able to access the drug doesn't mean you're safe to inject it. Most, well, any, any normal professional will go on a course to look at how to do that part safely. But the actual access to the drug is available if you have a local anaesthetic certificate. Perfect. So a podiatrist sort of working, as, as, as the phrase goes, to, to the top of their license, so to speak. Um, it's, it's a real exciting time. Well, it has been for some years, isn't it? The, you know, the real sort of ability to, like you say, sell, supply, administer a real wide range of drugs for a real, real wide range of conditions, as long as we are, as we say, going on the appropriate courses making sure our skills are up to date making sure we've done in the case of injections enough mentored injections um and keeping our knowledge up to date it's um it, it's pretty impressive the list that we've got available to us isn't it well I, I think it's a working list and it can enhance practice there has to be a level of confidence uh, a with use of drugs and that only comes I think with advanced skills with a certain amount of clinical knowledge behind you and the regular updating that is so important for any professional for their own um, practice to know that they're doing it right that that's the cornerstone I think for this yeah so on that note the the the, the, the general clinician that we've just talked about what are some of the must know the must know basics you know the pharmacology gems the real sound bites that if you could say right commit you know commit to maybe these three to five like, little little gems here and you're, you're in a good place does such a thing exist uh, i'm not sure that it does but gem number one would be to reiterate what i've already said would be to use the amazing resources that we now all have at our fingertips to remain updated with current practice. So for example, the number of people I speak to, this is all professions, not just the address, but I talk about the clinical knowledge summaries, for example, and I say to people, you know, you can just Google CKS, clinical knowledge summaries, gout, CKS, plantar fasciitis, CKS, whatever, and you will get the most up-to-date information immediately from assessment to diagnosis to management, pharmacological and non-pharmacological. And so it seems criminal not to use such resources to maintain your professional knowledge. We were talking about use of antibiotics, Public Health England, of course, give uh, appropriate and brilliant advice on a number of different areas, but they produce up-to-date tables of every single common condition and a summary of all the antibiotic approaches you will need. So to not know that that's online they're available to help you and you're using those antibiotics would be wrong so a point of safety i think is the first gem to always start from and then i would say two to three other areas whenever we're thinking about giving a drug by whatever route to another person the consideration is Right, well, this is my first line drug that I want to give you, and that's the right thing. It's the right evidence based approach. Is it safe now to give it to you? And then there are two branches to that. What conditions does the person have that might make it unsafe to use or may need modifying? So, with the, with the dose that you give, that could be renal impairment, that could be a comorbidity like a heart problem. Um, and what drugs are the person on? that might make it unsafe, that might affect their existing drugs or might mean that my drug is more effective or less effective than I'm introducing to the mix. So those principles, if observed, allow for a safe approach. And above all else, that is, they are the gems that you need to know to be a safe and confident practitioner. The word safe said a lot there, and I think that's an important, uh, an important one to, to reiterate, isn't it? Um, a question just come in from Sean um, 
over in Ireland. Hi, Sean. Hope you're well. Uh, why, as podiatrists, can we not use a mixture of steroid and LA, such as Kenalog? Physios can, but we cannot. Uh, yeah, so Kenalog, uh, which is triamcinolone, isn't part of your list in the UK. You can get a patient group direction, um, which means that you can get an arrangement with the hospital pharmacy in the UK. This, I'm not sure what part of Ireland uh, Sean is from, but if it's from Northern Ireland, uh, it should be the same. You can get a patient group direction, which means that you have permission, if you like, to give a particular drug at a particular dose only to a particular population of people. So the parameters might be um, adults from 18 to 80 who don't have conditions X, Y, and Z, but they do have conditions A and B, I don't know, plantar fasciitis or whatever it is you want to use the Kenalog for. And you can actually get that set up for your use. Now that is not something that people tend to do privately. There's a lot of bureaucracy. It does tend to be more of a health service model to get a patient group direction. So that would be one way that you can access a drug like Kenalog. You can lobby your professional body to try and get it put on your list, of course. That could take quite some time. Um, but you can also, of course, do a course in independent prescribing, which would then allow you to have access to uh, all the range of musculoskeletal agents you could wish for. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about independent prescribing a bit in a minute, actually. Mm -hmm. Graham has just quickly asked a question again, while we're kind of on the topic of local anaesthetic, um, is mixing of different uh, LAs still very frowned upon, um, meaning obviously two in, uh, meaning one injection versus two injections? I seem to recall, you know, a phrase back at university about mixing and stacking. Mm. Um, could we just uh, speak to that slightly, please? Yes. The local anaesthetic agents all have similar properties, particularly, of course, we, we use purely amide local anaesthetics, um, as listed before. And the maximum safe dosages for each of them individually are just that, for them individually. So when you talk about stacking, we can't take it that once we reach the maximum for say bupivacaine well we can then go and start again to reach the maximum on the lidocaine because they're essentially very very similar drugs and in doing so we're risking toxicity and we know that that can be extremely serious resulting potentially in convulsion respiratory arrest and ultimately um, serious cardiac features and again fatality so we don't really have the information to use local anaesthetic safely in a mixing context. It's also then tricky to say, well, I won't go to the maximum in each because we don't know how they will combine together. And there are issues of combining anaesthetics as well. When you think about how the great affinity of bupivacaine is for a receptor site in a nerve channel, with a lesser affinity of lidocaine, what you could find is that the lidocaine gets in first, the bupivacaine then can't get in, but hangs around for longer, and then the lidocaine goes and then the bupivacaine can go in. And you're in a situation where we can't predict the duration or the extent of anesthesia, nor the risk of toxicity. And because of that, and because it's really needed to do that, we've got a range of anesthetic agents and a range of different concentrations that should be sufficient to plan a procedure around, it seems imprudent to mix just because you might want to. If you had an appropriate rationale for doing so, for example, there used to be issues, you know, where you might bleb something to put in a nerve stimulator and then use a different anaesthetic into the deeper tissues, you may be able to form a rationale around that. But why would you routinely? You need the rationale. Yeah. And just to, um... Well, just to piggyback off the combination question, um, I know this is a question you get asked a lot when it comes to corticosteroids, uh, injectables and topicals um, at the same time. Uh, can we just talk to that? Oh, are you thinking of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now, over the last 20 or so years, we've seen a massive change in the way that we use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Used to be very common to use very high doses for short and sometimes long periods of time for ibuprofen. We used to give it 400 mg four times a day, no problem at all. And everything changed when it was discovered that 
high doses of ibuprofen and drugs like Voltarol, Diclofenac, ha had in some populations and a small risk for all of us, a cardiovascular risk. And that meant we revisited the way that we use non-steroidal agents. And at the same time, it became very frowned upon to use more than one non-steroidal at any one time. So the, guide the guidelines at the moment say no more than one unless the benefit outweighs the risk. And that includes somebody on a non-steroidal as a plate antiplatelet drug. So somebody might be on 75, 150 mg of aspirin for their uh, heart condition. We are not supposed to layer on more ibuprofen or naproxen unless there is a very good reason to do so. And the same goes for topicals because we don't have the evidence base to say whether it's safe or not. We do know that topical non-steroidals are absorbed. We can prove that when you put them on a finger or an elbow somewhere that's relatively close, tissue close to the bone, that the drug does get into the joint capsule. So it is absorbed into deeper tissues. It is taken up vascularly. And therefore, you are still more likely to have gut bleed, renal impairment, potentially asthma attack. And all of those things have happened with topical use. Less likely because we don't get the same peak blood concentrations, but they can still happen. So for the moment, we don't have the evidence base to support dual use of any two via any formulation. So generally speaking, for safety, it's one or the other. Um, that doesn't mean patients won't get stuff themselves over the counter, of course, and, uh, uh, and use them themselves without appreciating that, but we shouldn't advise it. Right. I just realised I could totally fluff that question and asked about the steroids when it was on the this is the, this is, <laughs> no, <that's okay. laughs> this, is, this is the problem when you go live. Um, so there haven't been any questions on that, so I'll move on, but I'll keep an eye on the questions anyway. Um, I'll move on to sort of, again, pragmatic things in clinics so in our musculoskeletal clinics we're very much told uh, or advised or guided towards when we're taking a history to check for things like quinolones because of their interlinkages with tendinopathy and tendon rupture um i'm sure there are there are you know other drugs that that, that will have influences or, or effects on on various tissues and you know even if we're not prescribers that we should probably be aware of could we i think most of us the quinolones is probably the easy one that everyone says oh yeah someone was on you know ciprofloxacin and they've now got an achilles tendon problem there might be a link there are there any other drugs that we need to be mindful of that should make our ears prick up when we're taking a history and someone lists certain drugs in in our clinics it's a tough question actually because a lot of drugs very common side effect would be arthralgia myalgia very few drugs um, uh, can do something as dramatic as cause tendon rupture um, so the quinolones probably do stand out in that regard and there's this blue box in the BNF accordingly um, with, with the warning about that. Um, I mean, but commonly used drugs such as statins, of course, cause a number of different musculoskeletal symptoms. They tend to be a bit more nebulous and a bit more general rather than something as specific as perhaps what people might walk into your clinic with, but can they exacerbate something existing? Maybe so. Um, so I can't think of anything really on the top, from the top of my head that would be red flag drugs that could cause something um, like a, an Achilles tendinopathy or, or anything that specific. Yeah, that's good. That's an answer in itself. It's good to know as long as we check for the, the quinolones. But like you say, myalgia, arthralgia, if we're in an MSK clinic, they're pro probably presenting with, well, maybe presenting with those things anyway, right? So um, it's good to know there are no other red flags. Um, a couple of other questions that were asked um, of you know, put to me to ask of you um, questions these are things that people when they're sitting in clinic and making some small talk they, they regularly get asked and they love they love your take on how to best answer these you know succinctly concisely accurately as well the first one patient saying to them oh I've been told to take a drug with after food or sometimes I've been told to take a drug before food or on an empty stomach um, and they often then ask the podiatrist, well, why would the doctor ask me to do this? And what's, what's the worst that can happen if I don't? Uh, is there a lovely little uh, sort of answer we can give to that? Well, though, those advice, those sorts of advice, the labels, the dispensing labels that drugs come with are based around the bioavailability of the drug. So we just want the drug to get into the body at the effective dose. But also, if as is something like your aspirin, if you don't take it 
with food, obviously it belongs to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory family, it's very rarely associated with tummy upsets. But if you just take it with a cup of tea, then you are risking causing problems where none needed to happen. So by following the rules, they are there to protect your, yourself from the drug, but also to get the maximum effect from the drug. So it's a win-win if you follow the instructions. Yeah, so do what you're told um, mm -hmm. to maximise the drug's effect and minimise its side effects. Great. Nice. Um, another one, um, antibiotics. Often, if you go into a party, you don't want to drink, or maybe you don't want to go to the party whatsoever. Uh, I can't come, I can't drink, I'm on antibiotics. Um, metronidazole, notwithstanding, because I'm understanding, uh, my understanding is it makes you really sick as a dog. Um, this is, is this a myth? And if this is a myth, if we can indeed drink with the antibiotics, where did this all come from? Yeah, it does come from the dulcifuram reaction that between alcohol and, as you say, metronidazole, which will give you the mother of all hangovers. Um, <laughs> I, I think there are a couple of issues there. If you have an infection that is serious enough to warrant systemic antibiotics, there would be an argument, perhaps from your mother, to say that should you really be going out drinking um, if you have something significant enough for that. Uh, so I think that's the first thing to say. Obviously, when you are on any drug at all, the drug has to be processed in and broken down. and We're relying on that process in order for safe levels of the drug to travel through your body. And it can be that alcohol, of course, does put some stress on your liver, does make it do other things other than break down the drug as it's supposed to be doing. So I think just from a general safety perspective, you want to get your organs functioning optimally when you are infected with something that could potentially be an issue for you. And that's really where that comes from. It's, they're not, it's not going to change the efficacy of the antibiotic normally, but I suppose you could argue it might threaten uh, your body's ability to fight the infection as effectively. There we go. So next time someone says to you, can't come out, well, not right now, because none of us are going out anywhere, but next time someone says to you, can't drink, come on antibiotics. If it's not metronidazole, you, you allow to, you can call them out. Dr. Reese said <laughs> you, can call, you can call them out. Um, so Craig, anything? My my screen down here is frozen. Any questions? No, no nothing. Um, nothing's coming. Um, right. There, there, what, actually, there, there, was, there was a comment that maybe could be addressed um, uh, from Andrea. She just said that she's the first in independent prescriber in her department, and, and said, you know, it's quite scary to try and prescribe on your own um, without support. So I wonder if you've got a comment on that, Sharon, at all. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, once the course is done, and it can take quite some time to get your PIN number, I think people often feel quite concerned about starting to prescribe. And in fact, when I do teach on the independent prescribing course at South Bank, and one of the things that I always think my job is done is when we come to the end of it all and the students go, I'm too scared to prescribe anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, marvellous, well, that's exactly how it should be. We should only be giving drugs <clears throat> if they're absolutely essential. But it can mean that, you know, somebody could lose some confidence. And I think I, I feel for you there. What I would say is that the best thing to do would be to write down some typical scenarios where people come in or you get requests from other people to see a patient and potentially prescribe for them. Think about what those common scenarios would be in advance and think about what will your response be and what will be the nugget of drugs, the initially probably quite restricted list that you're likely to be prescribing from and then take those scenarios and think okay well i've got this patient they're this age they've got this they've got no, there are no other drugs they're perfectly fit and well well i would definitely give them a course of x then how would that change if that person was on warfarin or had this condition oh okay i'd still give them that drug but i do it in a different dose maybe for a different period of time so i would just take yourself through those protocols in advance and then when they come up just take the easy ones first do things that feel comfortable to begin with take your time and then you will soon fall, fall into a pattern of feeling more confident with those decisions um actually another another question has just come in from Faye and i actually know the answer to it but i'll let you answer it sharon <laughs> um what what are the consequences of not finishing the prescribed course of antibiotics 
Well, yeah. yes, rather annoyingly, there was an article that came out and hit the news a couple of years ago, wasn't there, saying that, in fact, this was a poorly evidence-based um, um, uh, guidance. But, yeah, we believe still that the consequences are of that. If you think about a population in your tissues of bacteria, whatever it happens to be, within that population of thousands and hundreds of thousands of bacteria there will be some that have a greater survival advantage than others just by their genetic makeup and if we don't give the right antibiotic for the right dose at the, for the right duration of time what we believe contributes towards resistance is that the more the naturally more resistant ones have the ability then to divide once the course is finished, not completed, and then they will form the greater population with their resistant genes, they will multiply, and then thereafter, we will find it difficult to treat that person with that antibiotic because they will now have the population of resistant bacteria, which they can then pass on, of course, depending on what the nature of their infection is. So we believe this contributes to antimicrobial resistance, which is a huge global problem. And we're trying to do everything we can to limit the growth of this. And hence, we advise everybody to take the course as directed and to complete it. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. So um, once again, this, do what this, you're told. Oh. It all comes back to that. Yeah. So I was just going to say, this is a perfect example of why you should leave answering questions to the experts, even though I knew the answer to that question, I could not have answered it remotely as well as, as that. Um, but, it, but again, it, it just bring, conjures up those stories you read in places like Time magazine and, and about the antibiotic resistance, especially in some countries where the use of antibiotics is not as well regulated. And you, know, you, you obviously you do read those horror stories. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, in many countries, you can get antibiotics over the counter. The yeah. pharmacist is the gatekeeper for that. So it's not as if you can just buy them in any quantity you like. But of course, a pharmacy is a business. So there is the incentive, of course, to actually sell the antibiotics. And uh, certainly countries like Spain yeah. uh, have got some major, more major even than us, uh, resistance issues. Well, I think in some, I think in some countries, you know, the public are buying antibiotics over the counter for viral infections. And then they wonder why there's this antibiotic resistance problem developing, you know, it's, yeah, well, there um, is that as well, of course. Yeah. Now Faye's just posted a follow-up question to that. Um, can this happen just after a single course? I, I presume the answer is yes. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. And we're actually more careful now, particularly with um, vulnerable populations, such as people in nursing homes, people who have recently been in hospital, to actually check whether somebody's had a course of antibiotics in the last three months and what those antibiotics were, what the scenario was, whether there was concordance, because we know from experience now that there can be an issue with giving the same antibiotic again within that short time frame. Right, can we speak to independent prescribing just briefly just because i know it's, it's come up a couple of times and clearly it's it's you know we talk about working to the top of our license that is the very top of, of our license um what sort of commitment is it if someone's kind of listening to this and thinking i fancy a bit of that i guess two 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 questions come to mind the first is is there a particular area of podiatry where it would be more more suitable more more needed i'm thinking surgery versus diabetes versus pediatrics versus sports um and secondly if someone's thinking yeah i'm really going to look into that what, what sort of commitment are we looking at here what sort of length of course is it i'm guessing it's fairly intense and examined and, and um and uh is it distance learning i'm guessing not it's contact time just uh, a bit about that uh, i'm guessing it's is it similar all across the country you said you do it at, at South Bank, but it's probably done five, six places. It's, yes, it's, it's actually a very, very popular course. I mean, the nurses have driven this forward. They're an absolute juggernaut. I think there's over 60,000 prescribing nurses now. The pharmacists are coming up fast. There's still only about 4,000, but, but they're, they're moving up fast where there's only a trickle of allied health professionals. Um, the courses actually do vary quite a lot, but they all, in order to be validated, have to have some of the same features. Uh, however they are taught so the open university do do 
Um, one is distance learning. Um, I'm not sure if there are seminars and some face-to-face -face as well, but there are a variety of models as to how you can do this. It's usually six months. Some do a three-month talk part and then a placement part for three months, so it's still overall six months. So there are a certain, um, certain criteria for the commitment, as you say, over the six months. You need to have somebody who can mentor you. Now, until recently, that had to be a doctor, but now it can be somebody with the right experience who is an independent prescriber. Could be a consultant nurse, could be a podiatric surgeon. Uh, that, so there is a little bit more flexibility now, which is quite helpful because some people saw that as a barrier, that there wasn't a friendly GP or an orthopedic surgeon or somebody that could take them on. So you need to have somebody to do your placement hours with. That's usually around 90 hours uh, for that. And you write up a portfolio of the competencies that are given by the professional bodies. So the universities don't write the competencies. So that could be using blood tests in order to support the dose of a drug. You know, so there's, there's all of these, there's over a hundred competencies that you have to write up as part of this portfolio then all of the courses have a drug calculation exam which has to be passed at 100 percent not as scary as it sounds fairly basic maths um the pharmacology exam has to pass be passed at 80 percent and that's normally multiple choice questions short answer questions that kind of thing and then there's a variety of things some universities get you to do a poster about to dig in a bit deeper with a particular case some people do written case studies long essays that sort of thing and all the courses will cover the legal aspects of prescribing, the human factors that are involved, the psychology, the actual process of writing prescriptions, whether on hospital charts or FP10s, which are the prescription pads in the, that you see uh, electronically or in the GP surgeries. So they'll all cover certain basics and then some will do things a little bit differently according to what their model of teaching is. But it is quite a commitment for the six months, very, very worthwhile. I, I like the uh, the term that you're using there, Ian, um, reaching to uh, advanced practice because that is about professional advancement uh, and it helps the whole profession if somebody is seen to be a prescribing clinician, um, much, much more responsibility, much, much more respect. Yeah, great. Um just want to quickly talk about the the pharmacology bible if that's what it's still called the bnf um and i want to use myself as an example because uh, as we were talking about just briefly before we went live i'm sure it was you that said this to me when we were at northampton back in back however many years ago i won't say how many i don't want to, i don't want to age us but <laughs> i remember you saying to me don't buy don't buy a bnf go to the the pharmacy the window the pharmacy window at northampton general and, and ask them for an old one because it, they, they bring out a new one every six months and the old ones just get put in a room at the back and they'll give you one. And the BNF, I, I just dug around on my shelf behind here before we went live and I found it. And here she is, number 43, uh, March, March 2002. Now we are on number, what one have you got there? 77, 78? Yeah, 78. Just have a look at the thickness of them here, just how they differ. Uh, I just think this is a beautiful example of just how dangerous it would be for me to think, oh, I need to quickly check something and, and pull this bad boy off of my shelf. Um, um, could we just talk about how people best access this information now? It's, it's 2020, so we don't probably need to, I guess, knock on the pharmacy window and ask for a book. Uh, we just open our laptops. But um, what information is out there for people to keep really, really on top of this stuff? Yeah, this comes back to using an evidence-based approach, which is the first cornerstone of professional practice, isn't it? Whether it be in prescribing or otherwise. The BNF obviously is still produced and widely used, um, still coming up twice a year, getting ever thicker, as you can see from that. Massive changes to the BNF, apart from the number of drugs that are in it, but how the information is packaged and used to optimize all of the uh, prescribing issues that there might be. So it's massively improved since then. The cost of this one is $59.95. I'd like be interested to know what cost is on the back of your one there. Um, Let's have a look. Let's see. It doesn't have it on there, but I, you know, uh, I, I, I can't imagine it would have been 60 pounds. It's tiny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> probably 24 99 or something like that. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, it is really important to use the BNF for any prescribing decision as well as some of the other sources we discussed. The app is free. 
Uh, it doesn't even matter whether you're a health professional or not. And you can also go on to the BNF, which is part of the NICE group, where it says evidence, um, I think it's NHS or something like that. And you can access it via Safari as well as if you've got the app. The information is slightly different when you access it online, but all the key information is there. Obviously, you have to know what to put in and where to look to make sure that you link up some of the information for your individual drugs with the overarching uh, drug class monographs as well, because some information being the BNF is in different places. But uh, absolutely, online is almost certainly the way to go. It's kept more up to date and it's updated all through the year, not just twice a year. Brilliant. So, Craig, we're, I can tell by your body language we're approaching the hour. Is there anything <laughs> else? Uh, you get well, no, nervous, I, Sharon. I, 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 I only get nervous, Sharon, because if we go over an hour, the podcast version has to be a part one and part two. We can't have more than an hour in the podcast version. But look, the, the, the last thing I wanted to raise, and Sharon and I did talk about this before we came on, and, and that's the, the incredible responsibility that anyone has who has access to prescribing drugs. And, and I, when, you, when you were talking about the, the content that's in these independent prescriber courses, um, these, choices, these courses don't necessarily change human nature. Um, and what I'm sort of leading up to is, is something that blew up in the news here in Australia last week, was dentists have been caught prescribing the anti-malarial drug to themselves. And... Um, family members. Now, one, to me, that just goes against, you know, we're not supposed to prescribe drugs for ourselves anyway, let alone family members, let alone a drug that you really shouldn't have access to. So it has led to a bit of an outcry about, well, how on earth are they allowed to do this? The word non-medical prescribers was used in this article. Several comments below said, who the hell are these non-medical prescribers? Why are they allowed to get drugs? So I just really just, to me, just reflects that awesome responsibility we have and have to live up to if we have access to using these drugs and not to blow it and not to screw it up. Definitely. The code of conduct for all professional practice is that unless it's an absolute emergency, you cannot prescribe for yourself or friends or for family. But there is also the issue that maybe hasn't come up in this hour, which is about prescribing within your competencies. And for example, you won't find a GP in the UK normally prescribing biologic drugs. It's not within their competency. If they want the patient to get a patient on um, adulimumab, that person will see a specialist. And that's just right that that should be the case. And so for each profession, there will be boundaries within which they prescribe, which ensures that the patient gets the best possible level of treatment. Mm. And so people that are just breaking, flouting the rules um, for self-benefit, it does put a very bad taste in one's mouth. Yeah. And, and, and will we'll lead to regulations that will affect every, all of us, which is, uh, you know. Um, so before we go, Craig, mm. it hasn't skip my attention it's your birthday today as well isn't oh, it <laughs> and the reason i know this is because craig's craig's birthday is the same day as my wedding anniversary complete coincidence so it's very easy to <laughs> very easy to remember and obviously it's april the first which isn't here yet but it is tomorrow morning there. so obviously happy birthday craig you look Thank incredible you. For, uh, you look incredible for 90 years old i don't know how you do it uh, you just keep oh. going um but yeah happy birthday and right, um, thank you for and, agreeing to do an and, episode of and happy wedding so, anniversary for tomorrow <laughs> yeah um, actually we're, one we're, more we've th- got a really exciting one planned where we may even you know don't, we haven't decided whether we're going to go to the lounge or the kitchen yet we, we're going <laughs> to just see how the mood <laughs> takes us actually one one more thing before we go i just noticed no one has made a comment about our bookcases Hey. Right. <laughs> Disgusted. And mine's real, by the way, I should say. Yeah, mine is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, th- thanks so much, Sharon. It's actually been really, really helpful, and, and um, I'm sure everyone yeah, got really something good. out of it. A lot, again, as per usual, a lot of people have just joined in the last five, ten minutes. If you come back in ten minutes, Facebook will have the full video. It'll be up on YouTube later on today. Um, so, again, thanks um, so much, Sharon. It's been really good. Thanks, Sharon. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.